you are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Road. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Coming up on the brew session, Soul of Windgrace is somewhere between Primeval Titan and Solemn Simulacrum. Or is it secretly a Jund Omnath in disguise? Then on the flashback, testing results with Ether Channeler. That's all coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I am your host, Dan Schriever, coming to you from the holy city of Jerusalem. Joining me from all the way across the world in Buenos Aires, Argentina. You know him as more to light. It's Emmy Sagasti. Emmy, welcome. Hey, Dan, how's it going now that we're in the holy city? All right around here, just being surrounded by kittens. Literally just show Dan what a handful of kittens literally means. I do have a screenshot now. You've got all four of the kittens <laughs> squeezed up. In a pile. In a beautiful pile of kittens. How old are they now? Um, 22 days, I think. They're not even a month old yet. But they now have opened their eyes. One of the little ones had sadly... We had to take one of them to the, to the vet because they had a small eye infection. But they got pumped full of antibiotics and now they're fine. Tiny baby. They're starting to look more cat-like. Yeah, they stopped looking like mole rats. <laughs> but one needed antibiotics, and I was like, and I was telling my friends, and I was like, if that cat didn't got better after an after an antibiotic injection, which was literally, I think at a certain moment his body was like eight percent antibiotics. It was so sad because they're so tiny, and it was like so many antibiotics. If they didn't got better after that, they were not <laughs> they were not gonna get better ever. <sighs> but yeah, that's all they needed. Well, one of the great things about the Middle East is that there's street cats everywhere, like everywhere. And it's a very picturesque city. I think part of the building code for Jerusalem is that all buildings have to use a limestone facade. Or I'm not sure if it has to be limestone specifically, but they all have to have kind of a yellow stone. They have to retain their aesthetic. Exactly. So it matches the aesthetic of the walls of the old city. And it's really striking. And, you know, the thing about cats is they love to perch on walls. So I have, like... (laughs) You're surrounded by cats. Most of my pictures I've taken so far are just, like, random cats. There's also historic sites and stuff, but the cats, you'd be amazed at the cats. And there's historic sites with cats on it. Exactly. (laughs) Everything is cats. Mm -hmm. That sounds lovely, though. Being surrounded by stray kittens. There's a lot of stray kittens here because people... Communities tend to sort of adopt them. In the way, like, if the same stray kitten happens around the same houses, it's pretty common for people to just start feeding them and such, and it's like the neighborhood's cat. And besides that, how has this holy city been? I don't think anybody has heard much about your travels. Yeah, I'm on the road again. I mean, I mentioned a few weeks ago that I was packing up, and that's all done now. All of my stuff, all of my accumulated mess from however many years is just shoved into a storage unit. Hope to see it again in a few months, but in the meantime, yeah, my wife and I are just enjoying life. She's got a position as a researcher at an archaeological institute just outside the walls of the old city. And it's a pretty cool place. So, I mean, I'm just going to see as much as I can. It's a pretty well-connected country in terms of transit, and there's a lot of stuff to see. That sounds amazing. Yeah, it's been cool. I don't know what the magic scene is like. (laughs) <laughs> I never picture hey what's the magic scene in the holy city <laughs> <laughs> I mean as far as I know it's like Shahar Shenhar is like the undisputed king of Israeli magic I don't even know if he lives here and there's someone named Amit Eternal who is also from Israel but beyond oh, that yeah. I mean, everything is theoretical right <laughs> like, if anyone here is listening from Israel and wants to like clue me in on what the Magic scene is. What the local scene is. Are there RCQs? <laughs> How does this work? 
Oh, I just gotta love it. You have not seen the pictures that Dan has sent me of him living in a literal monastery. I don't have the estimate that Dan is a close friend to the Pope. And now he's one now he's a holy man of the world, everybody. <laughs> you don't have tiny kittens staring right at you, but you have the holy city. No, I, I do have tiny kittens staring at me. Like I really do. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a museum yesterday and I looked out the window because it was in a basement level where they keep like the antiques and like some really interesting scale models of the Temple Mount that some German guy had made. And I looked out the window and like there was this little face just staring at me. <laughs> this little tiger striped cat. That sounds super ominous. Like you imagine just being at that museum and looking at the window and stray cats staring at your eyes deep into your soul. <laughs> that sounds so ominous. I'm okay with it. It's the good type of ominous. Well, we have a cat-themed show today. <laughs> that lined up perfectly. <laughs> today we are actually talking about a literal cat in magic, a cat avatar. Today's card is Soul of Windgrace. So we're going to be brewing up some decks with that. This is a card that, you know, it looks reasonably powerful when you add up all its stats, but it hasn't seen a ton of play yet, you know, outside of the odd 5-0 in Modern and like a Jund deck. So we're going to take a look at it, see how it works, see if there's something else to discover. What can we find behind the beautiful cat avatar? Exactly. After that, we'll tell you a little bit about our testing with last week's card, which was Ether Channeler. I played a couple of leagues in Pioneer using some of the concepts that David talked about. Mord, I think you also got a chance to play a bit in Modern. Yeah, with something pretty stuck. So we'll report on our findings with that as well. So that's the plan of attack for today. And again, just a quick reminder at the top that if you're enjoying the show, want to help support us, best way to do that is by joining our Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. That gets you access to our Discord channel. That's where all of the kitten pictures are being posted there and on Mord's Twitch stream. That's twitch.tv slash Mord to Light. He doesn't plug it often enough, so I'm going to try to remember to <laughs> direct everyone there. There's no time to waste. The kitten cam, I mean, it's there, but... The kitten cam is the best idea, because what's better than looking... And a tilting guy playing magic is looking at four kittens just scrambling around in the box. Yesterday we almost had an escapee. <laughs> he was like on the verge of the thing and not able to like turn around. <laughs> so they can't escape yet, but they're trying, trust me. They want you to leave the box. This is the premium content that you will find at Mord's Twitch stream. Go check it out. And you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're not a regular Twitch viewer, um, you know, you can subscribe. That actually helps support Mort's stream. If you use like Amazon Prime, you get a free Twitch subscription that you, you know, you've just been paying for and haven't been using it. Why not send that Mort's way? Yes, sir. Help him buy some treats for the little ones. <laughs> my, all my friends are telling me I should just let Sav's name the kittens for a day. Like, if, <laughs> because I can only identify them via number because I can name them for emotional reasons. But naming them for a day is the same. Like, if you just name them for a day, it's the same as actually having the number, so that works. That sounds perfect. So you can decide the name of one of the tiny idiots I have right next to me. I can even show them to you. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah. Go check out more stream. Check out our Patreon if you're interested in the Discord as well. That also gets you other perks. For example, you can vote for cards for our monthly project. We talked about... 14 of the cards that have been nominated for next month. There are some wild ones, and we've just opened up the voting. So if you heard that episode and want to make your opinion known, we're leaving the voting open for about a week. So you can get in there and help us choose the right card to brew next. What's the worst thing that could happen besides making us try to make March of Persian in life work, which might get you a permaban from the Discord, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think, I don't know who asked a question regarding tokens and I immediately was like, no, no, you're right. However, any mention of any deck list <laughs> in March might get you permaban due to common decency. Let's kill your trout. We still love you, trout. You're our favorite fish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Soul of Windgrace. Emmy, tell us about this card. 
Soul of Wind Race, better known as the Soul of Wind Race, due to that beautiful panel art where that guy looks freaking soul, <laughs> is what happens when you try to get Omnath in Shun colors and you have to make it bad because you are not using the best color in magic, which is blue. However, Bad Omnath is still a great magic card, which is a 4 mana 5 4 Shun and a 1 cat avatar legendary creature. When it enters the battlefield, all attacks. Put a land card from a graveyard onto the battlefield tapped under your control, and it has three abilities reminiscing of Omnath. Pay a green, discard a land card, gain three life. Pay a red and, and, and any color, discard a land card, draw a card. Which, for some reason, whenever I read that ability, I think of the enchantment from Modern Horizons that gives all the lands in your hand cycling. And finally, chew a black, discard a land card, give it indestructible, and tap it. Huh, yeah, that actually is very similar, right? That's the same rate. Yeah, it's literally the same rate. That enchantment gives land cycling too. Exactly. I don't know. I only think about it when I see that when I see that card. When I see that ability. Tectonic something. Tectonic. Tectonic. Instability. Yeah, that doesn't sound right. I, something. No, but you're like you're on the right track. Like it's like saying terramorphing expands. Yeah, it's <laughs> not that, but I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> so soul of wind grace. Swole of Wind Grace just comes with that built in. That's nice. I mean, the gist of it is it's a four mana creature that gets a land when it comes into play and when it attacks. And then it has more text that, you know, I'm honestly not sure if. It's not quite as vanilla as you think. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm hoping to learn. I know you've actually had a chance to play with this. You're already 5 up with the card. So you can tell me a little bit about, like, what we can expect from the Soul of Wind Grace. Of course. I also, in that list, I also had a Valky without Ring Shulat, which means I'm not the best brewer to find around. <laughs> wow. People, why don't you hear me? Coming soon to the 5 O's, a soul Velki, the last survivor after his Bring to Lights got cut from the deck. I'm being personally attacked by Chief, and he's commenting around on random four color necklaces that people post for tournaments and such, and he's like, Where's the Mortulite Valky special? Wow. <laughs> I'm getting personally bullied for this 5 O. All right, so just a couple of rules notes to make sure that we understand before we like dive into the intricacies of the card. We are talking about a legendary cat avatar, so you can't have two in play, or you can and you'll get an extra trigger, but there, there is some question of if I'm building a solo wing race deck, am I actually going to play four of this? <laughs> Mord came out blazing with the Omnath comparison. I'm, I'm not totally convinced that it's as good as Omnath, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's not out of the question that we could play a full play set. The trigger happens on entering the battlefield or on attack, so that's that Titan trigger, if we can use that expression. This does give me a little bit of Primeval Titan vibes, I don't know if that's fair to say. I think saying this is not even close to Omnath and then comparing to Primeval Titan is an insult and a personal attack to the Titan players in the world. Well, Omnath is way better than Titan, though I think we've established that, haven't we? <laughs> Does anyone even dispute that anymore? <laughs> no, no, we don't. Okay. All right, so maybe like a slightly worse Primeval Titan, but maybe slightly better. You know, Titan can be attacked. This is just like a reasonable card. You can play this yeah. in a normal game of Magic. Yeah, this is not a combo card. That's one of the things I found out. This is... Like, this is not something you're just trying to go, like, run, pinch, and try to win. This is just a regular, good top end. Yeah, so whenever this triggers, you're putting a land from any graveyard directly into play tapped that doesn't count as your land drop so it is ramping you that's very nice gets from any graveyard that means if your opponent has something if they have a fetch land you can just go ahead and use that um, there's no exile or anything like that so you could in theory just keep reusing the same land every turn you know in in some christmas land scenario where solo wing grace remains in play and the game has not ended yet interestingly it does not target the land super interesting that has a couple consequences First, that means that you're not exposed to something like Unlicensed Hurst. You don't have to say, okay, I'm attack with Wind Grace, target this Bloodstained Mire, and they can respond with Cling to Dust or whatever. They can't do that. Instead, you attack, you put the trigger on the stack, and when it resolves, you just bring something back, right? They won't know what is getting brought back until it's already happened. Same if you're taking the opponent's land. I think that that might have been because they wanted to interact with these discard abilities. Like, you can attack with Solo Wind Grace, 
put the trigger on the stack, and then in response to that trigger, then you can discard a land from your hand to like guarantee that you're getting it back. But I don't know, maybe that's just like a weird corner case. Yeah. Yeah, actually that makes sense. I didn't think about the fact that it sort of enabled itself that way because you could discard at the same time. I did, however, that one of the few times I played it like on its own, actually fought and a license hurts, and the fact that it didn't target was so good. Oh, it worked. Yeah, yeah, I even got back two canopies from my opponent. <laughs> did they just not realize that you could do that? They should have just taken out their own canopies? Um, the first time they didn't realize, by the second time the curse was gone because I assumed they were going to realize. Hmm. So it sort of made sense to just get my canopy where I could. But I, I don't think I would have realized myself even. Like, I cannot blame them. Like, my opponent plays a soul of wind grace. The last thing I'm looking at, oh, oh do I have an unutility land in my own graveyard? All right, so that's how the card works. Mord, if we've decided we're going to build around Soul of Windrace, what are some of the key questions that we should be thinking about? Well, first of all is how do we consistently get lands in the graveyard, because we can't rely on, your, on our opponents to do that. So it's super important to either A, have enough fetch lands that we can get them consistently, or B, play good enough triumphs so that we can consistently get use of our opponent's fetches. Taking into account this is a Shun color card and we're likely playing it in a domain deck or a value deck, it's pretty likely that we're gonna have access to every fetch land likely, hmm. like from our opponents. It, as long as it's not something like, I don't know, Polluted Delta? Most of the time you're at least gonna be able to... No, even that Polluted Delta you have access to. What do you not have access to? Um, Mystery, no, Mystery Forest you do. Um, is that Flooded Strand? Yeah, it's just flooded. It's the only two color combination you don't have. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. So even if you're just playing the minimum three colors. As long as you're playing the minimum three colors and your opponent isn't playing exactly as Sodius and has exactly flooded strand, you should be able to even use our lands. And that's pretty nice. So that's pretty common. Secondly, if not, you could just self mill or lure lands away via Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Liliana or Legend Trader, self mill via cards like Shadow Prophecy, because why not play the best common from the last set? <laughs> Third mode, which is likely one of the most common ones, and which is why how Spike started to popularize the card a few weeks ago, was via Ursa Saga, which is like the card's most powerful interaction. Because buying back Ursa Saga is not that far away from buying back a spell. Right, right. I mean, fetch lands are definitely the lowest cost to put those into your deck, but that does cap the power of Lord of Wind Grace. I keep saying Lord of Wind Grace. That's not it. <laughs> what is it? Soul of Wingrace? Soul of Wingrace. But Lord of Wingrace makes a lot of sense. I don't know exactly the flavor from this creature. Like, I know who Wingrace is. I just don't know why this is a soul. I think that it's like the spirit of Elaine. I'm not quite sure. I think the original cat guy was named Lord Wingrace. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was. I don't know what he was Lord of. Some cat religion thing. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Some cat religion. Some sector a cat sort of thing, you know, the cat that was staring at Dan brought down from the window the other day. Yeah, that cat was a member of the cat. So in terms of like getting more from your lands, right? Saga does the most of any land, right? You can actually activate that several times. Channel lands, you know, you'll likely have some of those in your deck, but when you bring those back with Solo Wind Grace, they just come back as lands that tap for one. So that's actually not super powerful. That actually like takes them out of the the run and six cycling economy. So like, I'm not sure that's great, but that could happen. And then man lands, if you want more out of the lands, canopies would be nice too. Yeah. I mean, canopy lands are likely one of the best. I think canopy lands might be one of the best interactions besides Ursa Saga. Something really fun, I think would be like with Ghost Quarter, but I haven't even dig into that. Mm -hmm. Like it's a super easy way to record something like Ghost Quarter or Field of Ruin or any... Any way to actually pressure on your opponent mana base. Yeah, I mean, if you listen to what we've discussed so far, imagine that you're interested in Pioneer, which I know a lot of our brewers are. There, your only fetch land to speak of is Fable Passage, and I guess technically the common, the common ones from Nuka Pena. But, you know, there's plenty of Fables going off. There's plenty of cards being cycled away. There's plenty of cards being looted to Ledger Shredders. People play the channel lands, so it's not out of the question that 
between like incidental lands getting looted away between like your fable passages and your occasional channel lands and maybe if you want to look into ghost quarter there like there, there is stuff in the pioneer card pool even without the power of modern fetches yeah yeah like i think there's enough cards to get back like it's super easy to get lands in the graveyard like that's never a struggle in particular in any format actually unless you're playing standard i don't know Hmm. But as as long as you're getting lands out of your graveyard with a soul of wind race, and I think the other way to look at it is exactly how you described it. As long as you have the first land, the second ability is gonna make sure you get your next land drops likely. Like as long as you're not incredibly mana screwed, and mostly if you're flooded, the fact like in response to a trigger you can just cycle a land from your hand and put it into play, it's at least gonna transform the soul of wind race into a constant two for one effect. So. The discard abilities of Soul of Wind Grace, that could just be the source of lands, is not like a huge benefit, but it's something, right? It means that assuming you have nothing else going on, no fetch lands in sight, you just draw your card for the turn, oh, it's a land. Instead of just playing it, I get to discard it to one of the soul's three options. I either get three life, I cycle it with a red ability, that seems like the best one, yeah. or I hold it as protection for Soul of Wind Grace, and then I still get to play the land afterwards. I mean, how important is that? You've, you've had a chance to play with this a little bit. Does this come up? The most important ability from, from this card by a mile was this card land draw a card. Mm -hmm. As when I was flooded in a game and I started just like cycling through my deck as I kept making land drops because I had like three lands in hand. It was like cycle, cycle, play a land drop, get a land back, next turn cycle, cycle. And it just managed to carry the game by digging me through a whole bunch of lands while being a threat my opponent could not deal with because they were one time on Mugtai, the other, I think, on, like, Ragdos. And the fact they could just make it indestructible at instant speed was what made it unkillable for them. Like, this third ability looks really dumb, but it's actually super annoying for a lot of decks. That's good to know. Three mana is a lot, but, I mean, that's the difference between having and not having a big threat, so... Yeah, it's a big threat that self-protects itself while being able to cycle through your lands. It was interesting. In the deck I played it, I didn't try to exploit it in any way, shape, or form, but rather it was... So I'm playing 30 lands, I need not to flood, so I need a bit more of top end. Ring to light is sadly not a playable card in this modern format. What can I find? Because I can't play more than for Omnath. I think where I was discussing with Jan Ning and he was like, I would like to play Four Soul of Wing Race and I'm like, you're insane. But you are right in that Soul of Wing Race is a card that cannot get removed as easily in fighting, fighting the stack and chest and such. Hmm. So the, the fact this is a threat that doesn't get hit by mystical disputes, spell pierce, and a lot of common interaction your, the rest of your deck is going to hit by is super important. Because that's sometimes an upside on cards we don't consider, which is the fact they cannot be attacked in the same way, way as your deck does, means they get better even if they are worse. So you mentioned mystical dispute. What is like the fail state of a card like Solo Wind Grace? Obviously, you're paying four mana, probably on your turn. If it resolves, you're getting, let's say, one trigger, then the opponent plays Leyline Binding or whatever. Is that a disaster or is that like an acceptable result? That's an acceptable trade in most scenarios, especially because with the cards it trade with, it works in the opposite way as Somnath. So Soul of Wing Race and Somnath trigger works completely in the opposite way regarding what the rest of your hand looks like. Like if I'm on top deck mode and I play a Somnath and it dies, it's, okay, I, I got my country, I got my two for one already. However, if I have a, a handful of cards and I'm looking for mana, playing a Soul of Wing Race and it dies is much less devastating than with Omnath. Because A, I could cycle if it's in the late game and I have been holding lands, I can cycle through them in response, and I could at least play my lands in if not. Something that happened at least one time was the fact that I play a sort of wing race like turns 8 or 9 and I had been holding one or two lands and being able to like cycle a land and gain 3 life in response to my opponent removing it. Which was a lot better than anything that could have happened with Omnath. So you can kind of take all of your existing heuristics for what happens when Omnath dies to removal and just say solo wing race is kind of the same, it's just that it always draws a rampant growth. Yeah. 
which isn't great because a lot of the time I'm not looking to draw a uh, rampant growth. But sometimes a rampant growth is exactly what you need. Like, how many times do you just lose because you have not been able to ramp and you have the gas in your hand, you just don't have the speed for it. Hmm. And Son of Wing Race really helps with that. Omnath also helps with that when it survives, but Son of Wing Race doesn't even have to survive. There was also this game against Hammer where my opponent went turn 1 Esper Sentinel, turn 2 Esper Sentinel, Esper Sentinel. And I went like turn 4 Son of Wing Race, get a land, attack. Turn 5, get a land. Turn 6, attack, get a land. And that gave me the ability of started playing through the game while not giving them a million draws from their 3 Esper Sentinels because I kept finding land drops. That's impressive. You know, I didn't realize at the start that we were going to be doing such a detailed comparison to Omnath, but I'm kind of persuaded. And now I'm wondering, I keep staring at this alternate art Swole Windgrace. <laughs> Swole. <laughs> like, who would win between Swole Windgrace and Chonky Omnath? No, sadly, Chonky Omnath wins because of a variance in size. Okay, Chonky Omnath is just huge. Chonky Omnath, the new Omnath is just huge. Swole Windgrace is like 10 human size, and Omnath is like a mountain in its last versions. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Om the Chonky Windgrace sadly doesn't stand up. But still, what I think is, it's too easy to discard this card because we're comparing it to Omnath. But comparing to a card that a lot of people complain it's man level worthy, even if slightly worse, it's on easier colors to cast, has its own particular set of synergies, and is able to actually sort of take a head of games on its own. No, I'm not saying this is the best card ever seen. But also, I was quite happy having it as my fifth copy of Omnath. Which is not a pride many cards can get behind, because... What else do you think might be better than... What else can you compare it to? I'm eager to learn the truth about this card. You know, when we first saw it, I said, this is Primeval Titan. David said, this is Solemn Simulacrum. And now Mord <laughs> is saying, this is Omnath. <laughs> the truth is somewhere between these. We're going to have to figure it out. I'm like, if I had to take my stance, I think I'm on the. It's closer to Omnath than any of them. It's, of course, below Omnath. So if Solid Simulacrum is a 0, Omnath is a 1, Prime Time is a 2, I think this is at like 0.8. Hmm. Okay. And, like, it's being close. It's a lot easier to cast through a Blood Moon effect or such, where you only need like a Forest and Abundant Growth. It's not like devastating under that sort of effect when compared to something like Omnath. All right, so we believe in this card enough to run the experiments and to go through yes. a few different deck lists. As we're going through these concepts, you'll see a few themes coming up, and we can kind of ask ourselves how each deck answers these questions. Questions like, okay, what kind of lands are we using? Are we actually a lands matter deck? Or are we just using soul as generic mana ramp and cycling for our future mana producing lands? Are we going for something like Urza Saga, Valakut, Channel Lands, or are we just happy to just get extra mana from a few bonus fetch lands? Are we trying to ramp towards something? Like, are we using Solo Wind Grace as a bridge in a mana curve, or is this actually our literal top end? Right? There's one way to think about this, which I think Mord, you pointed out very nicely, is that, okay, once you have Solo Wind Grace, you can just discard all your future lands. You, you don't need any more lands. It just gives you an outlet for any future land you would draw. And it's a 5 4 body, which, you know, may or may not be. An acceptable finisher. A 5 4 body that transforms every land you draw into gain 3 life for a cycle, to say the least. And never disregard the free life. So, I have seen this meme a lot, don't know if you know it, Dan, where you have like a really, you have a common take, and it's like the skill level of the first 15% of players, and it's like a weird take, like life gain is amazing. Then you have like the average player curve and it's like uh, life gain sucks, I should do the good, nice stuff. And then you go back to the pro players and it's like life gain is amazing. It's true. <laughs> I have seen that, so, yes. <laughs> so that exact meme, of course it's a meme, but the fact is based on in like consequential life gain, like that, like, like Lightning Helix, Kaya Sky, Soul of Wind Race, Omnath. That life gain that teaches us like stapling to a, an already good card, it's amazing. Because you're not wasting resources and then you're not wasting slots on it but you don't realize the number of games that being like hey i just gained seven random life from i don't know where <laughs> yeah and if i've been slamming shadow prophecies 
all game, like embarrassingly, <laughs> like going down to three life off this. <laughs> like, yeah, I would like the ability to gain some of that back without embarrassing myself. Like, yeah, I'm not willing to play um, any of the healing salves or anything, but if I randomly have to discard two lands to gain six life, but I flooded with my bread and six, I'm not gonna say no. Also, bread and <laughs> six plus soul is amazing. Yeah. So that's the other piece of this is how much are we in the land space, right? We know about cards like Renin 6. We know about Tireless Tracker. We know about Titania, yeah. even Elvish Reclaimer. If you want to get weird, there's Slogurk, there's Life from the Loam, there's Seismic Assault. There's plenty of stuff. Primeval Titan. Are we playing Soul of Windgrace as part of that package? Are we like exposing ourselves to graveyard hate? Or are we just having Soul do its own thing? And we'll see how different uh, shells answer these questions as we go through. Yeah. So maybe just to kick things off, let's start with the list that has helped put Soul of Ingrace on the map and brought it back into public consciousness, which is just a very basic Jund Saga Van shell. This is something that Aspiring Spike was streaming a week or two ago, said he had some promising results, and when he says that, you know, a lot of people have to try it for themselves, and yeah, the, <laughs> the five O's have been rolling in. So Morg, why don't you talk us through what's in this deck and how Soul functions? Yes, sir. So... If any of you have ever played Shan or look at many Shan leagues, you will realize that besides the staple really stockish Thoughtseize, Spiral Push, Inquisition, Lightning Bolt, Kragav, and Thermogoy, Friend and Six, you always have that post Lurus one, of course. Seven, six to eight slots of what are my two for one creatures slash spells that are trying to win me the game after I one for one my opponent into Oblivion, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you just keep one for one in, you're gonna lose two. A uh, Teferi, an Omnath, an expressive iteration. What puts me on the top of that? One of the most common answers has been also at Ursa Saga as a way to go ahead on that. And Spike has gone and added into that Ursa Saga's package three Soul of Wing Grace and two Tireless Tracker. Also, one Squee, but that's just Squee, being Squee. <laughs> There's also the argument that the first Squee is worth a lot more than the second Squee. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, it has escape, so... Exactly. It's exactly that. It's a Shun Saga Band package with the addition of Soul of Wing Race as a way to keep returning your sagas if your Brain and Sixes keep dying. Also, the fact you don't have to use a land drop on getting your saga means you can actually get multiple sagas going at the same time. Yeah, I mean, here it's like, okay, Urza Saga is the most powerful thing we can do with Soul of Wing Race. Let's just put the cat in an environment where it can succeed, right? We know that the Saga Van shell works. It's going to trade resources. It's going to break up what the opponent's doing with discard spells. We're not asking for that much from the Soul of Wing Race here. Oh, no. But we're giving it the chance to, like, really shine with the Sagas, really shine with the Tireless Trackers. And, yeah, I mean, it's, this is the Curve Topper here. Exactly. So here's a curve topper. It works in a similar way than it did in the version I was playing it alongside Omnath as a curve topper of a mid-range deck. However, here it has the huge additional value of, get of getting back Ursa Saga. Which means it can win games on its own. All right, Mord, you talked about your version, and as we know, that usually means a Sky Noodle 80 card Yorian deck. What were you playing with Soul of Windgrace? So... I was really hating Modern because I wasn't able to find myself. And all of a sudden, I wake up, I look at the latest 5 0 preliminaries and such, looking for divine inspiration because I was getting my ass kicked also in Pioneer, which means I was just getting kicked in all the wrong places. And I see a 3 1 preliminary result by Young Dingo, which was like five color domain with four ring to lights. I go ahead, I take the deck list. First thing I realize, Necklace is great, because it's playing... It was 4 Ice Fan Quarrel, 4 Omnath, 4 Solitude, 1 Fury, 4 Venom 6, the stock, of course. But then we had 3 Shadows Prophecy, 4 Bring to Lights, Supreme Verdict, Palky, and a bit of a Bring to Light package. Sadly, the first thing I realized is Bring to Light sucks. Yeah. 5 mana blue sorcery in this format is not something you can afford to tap down for. Is that just because... It's vulnerable to literally everything. <laughs> exactly. Form. You're vulnerable to Teferi, Void Mirror, hate against Living End, hate against Five Mana Sorceries, which is literally any card in Magic. Mystical Dispute, Spell Pierce, Force of Negation, anything counters this. 
yeah, everything stops running today in this current format. And like literally everything will stop it, so it's not like you can rely on that. And so I go to Young Dingo and I'm like, hey, Dingo, love the deck list, Ring to Light sucks. And he was like, yeah, I agree, it was the worst card in the deck. So what would you add? And he was like, oh, I wanted to play three Souls of Wing Race. And I'm like, I think you're insane. Because I think just going to seven Omnath is a bit too many. However, I added one because I was like, it's insane, but it actually has the opposite problem Range Light has. Nothing that counters four color mid range counters. Soul of Wind Race. No Teferi, no, no counters, no dispute. No one is gonna sideboard aggressively against your creature package. So besides, besides something like Subtlety, all the most common hate against your deck, and a lot of people will play around that, right? A lot of people will make plays assuming that you will see people tap down and hold up a dispute, assuming, okay, it's four color mid range. What non blue threat are they gonna play? A Brennan 6? Huh. Yeah, interesting. So it worked. It had a huge advantage of playing on a whole different axis than the rest of the deck due to its colors and the fact it's a creature that Radomnas. And that was pretty useful. It actually was super helpful in a lot of games. And when you're playing this version of the deck that you're also sporting cards like Shadow Prophecy and such to keep the gas going, having more mana is always an advantage. Even if you have it in the form of uncracked fetch for future... for... Future Omnath, or the fact you, if you have been holding one or two lands, you will be able to cycle through them. It's bound to always be pretty useful to have more mana in this particular deck. Like, sometimes you just have turns where you need, like, 11 mana all of a sudden. So the basic core is what we think of as four-color Omnath, but as we've talked about in the previous weeks, at this point, you should be going five-color for your Leyline Bindings. You have four copies here. Once you're into black... That does give you the option to play Shadow Prophecy. You're playing three Shadow Prophecies and two Kaya's Guiles. Yeah, so I'm playing Kaya's Guiles have sort of graveyard hate in the main deck. Also, I needed a way to stop the bleeding. The painful mana base alongside Shadow Prophecy does add up. And I had a lot of removal because I'm playing the full playset of Ending, the full playset of Binding, and two balls. So I assumed I could slow down my curve slightly by adding cards like. Lightning Helix and Kaya Sky, like, maybe slightly off-tempo. If you have 10 one-mana removals, you can afford four of your removals to turtle around for them to be more valuable. Ironically, the first game I play after the Ring Light list, I 5-0, and I won, like, three rounds due to Kaya Sky. Because round one, round one I faced Calibrated Blast, and I got saved by Kaya Sky Exile Effect. <laughs> also, I hate Calibrated Blast. Let me drop that. I hate playing against Calibrated Blast. T always 15 me. <laughs> well, I'm glad that Shadow Prophecy has kept its spot. I mean, I know that was one of the questions that was not resolved yet the last time we checked in on it. And I feel like it's not widely adopted yet. It's still not like the stock build, but I think it's powerful. I think it might eventually. I think Shadow Prophecy is going to slowly bite its voice into people's hearts. Also, I just realized that Shadow's Prophecy flavor text is Lord Wingrace grant me wisdom. It's telling you how you got to curve Shadow Prophecy into Lord, Soul of Wingrace. <laughs> it's the perfect curve. It's in the card, everybody. The card says the card. Reading the card explains the card. Exactly. It, it says to play with Wingrace. Also, fun interaction. I went to an RCQ yesterday. I didn't go to play. I just went to like sell cards and hang out with the guys. And. One of the guys there had won an RCQ like a few weeks ago with Slogork. This was before all the domain stuff. So we spent like one hour discussing how she would play Slogork today. And Shadow Prophecy plus Slogork plus Soul of Wingrace seems amazing. Because Shadow Prophecy gives plus two plus two to my Slogork because I mill two lands. And then I can just bounce it back with an instant speed effect. Can be super amazing. Yes, and once you're doing that with Slogurk, I mean, you, you do want more lands in play. Solo Windgrace does that. This could be a sweet lands package. It will be a little little bit more vulnerable to graveyard interaction. Oh, yeah. If you're going full Slogurk, full Solo Windgrace, I assume you have, what, Ren and Six in there as well. <laughs> but yeah, if you can come up with a build like that, I would love to hear how it performs more when we check back on this card next week. Yes, sir. So... That's kind of the, the good shells. Basic John Sagavan, 
five color Omnath Shadow Prophecy. <laughs> the thing is, these shells can't fade, right? Because even if the soul is sort of bad, the. Even if the soul is me medium, the shells are so powerful, they're gonna be able to pull through. Exactly. So to truly put it to the test, we have to surround it with just absolute <laughs> clowns. Just give it nothing to work with. Exactly. We have to make we have to make it be the good card in the deck or collapse. Say so you gotta carry me, Soul of Wind Grace, because the rest of my deck is just Bard class and Targnar Demon Fang gnolls. That's what I'm gonna start my testing with. Targnar Demon Fang It's such a long bad name. I love Bard class, as you know. Unfortunately, once you fill your deck out with a roster of legends, you end up with kind of a non-synergistic pile of stuff. Some of it's good, right? I, I've learned to just slam four Regavans, four Ren and Six, four Bard Class. That's the beginning of something good. But then once you start rounding out the deck list with like Golly of the Endless Dance, Zergo Bell Striker, Rada Irida Celts, like these cards don't really do anything. They're just there so that when you level up Bard Class all the way up to level three, uh, you have enough free legends to play your entire deck. That includes playing Mox Ambers up to four times, and that generates red mana to cast your lightning bolts. And between those lightning bolts that you'll find and some dash creatures, you know, Galia has haste, Zurgo can have haste, Ragavan can have haste. That should be enough to kill an opponent from anywhere to 12 to 15 life. And I've tried this numerous times in the past. Oh, we know. It's sweet when it works. We have seen you suffer. The part that is a real bummer is that, okay, like, if they disrupt you, you're just toast. And the way that I got around it in the past was to just suck it up and splash white and blue so that I can play four Omnaths in my red-green bar glass deck. <laughs> I hated to do it because it made the mana, like, really painful, really awkward, and just, like, embarrassingly awkward. Yeah. It was kind of embarrassing that my sweet brew required Omnath to prop itself up, but it just, like, had to be done. It was the opposite of what we were trying to do with Soul, right? It was like, instead of trying to make Barclass good, it's like, what if we give it Omnath as a lifesaver? Yeah. So what I'm going to try this time is, okay, we're going to forget the Omnath, right? We don't need it. Don't need it. <laughs> we got Soul of Wind Grace. <laughs> Directly swap in for Soul of Wind Grace. No, it doesn't draw cards, so it doesn't refuel in the same way that Omnath does, but it, it does serve a similar function of like getting me towards the requisite amount of mana that I need to hit level 3 on Bard class. It's easier on the mana, it gets 2 cost reduction, which is nice. It helps me to support Corvald Fey Cursed King, which is a card that I've wanted to play, but I couldn't quite justify it, as like another top-end way to refuel. So now I'm playing 4 Solo Wind Grace, 2 Corvald. I've cut the Omnas, I've cut the Chandra Dress to Kill. That means that I'm allowed to play Gigantha again in my companion board. So, you know, this is like a more coherent, less ambitious build a bard class. But I think I'll start with this <laughs> and just see what happens. Yeah, I think it really helps with the mana. Like, this mana base and like, this setup looks a lot more realistic, at least. Also, you can tell Dan actually enjoys this man a lot more because he added Blood Moon to the sideboard in multiple ways. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've gone away from... I used to have more Blood Moons than Megus, but I think now, because of Force of Vigor, you... you Megus is better. You want to play more Megus. Also, I'll say you. Uh, yeah, true. So yeah, always go for... Always go for more Magus nowadays, everybody. It's not going to get you as many free wins because you don't say it in against decks like Four Color or Rhinos. But it's so much better in the games you need it. Tron, Amulet, and such. Please play Magus and don't play Blood Moon. In your cyborgs, of course. In the main deck, play your Blood Moons. Yeah. Why is Kalein in this deck, is my question. Well, Kalein is mana neutral. I mean, it's sort of like an extra ramp card. I was considering whether to play a second copy of Radha, Heir to Keld. So all the bad legends, Zurgo, Galia, Radha, Targnar, Clothis, these are all one ofs None of them are powerful enough to justify a second copy. Don't, don't you dare put Clothis in the same bracket with Targnar. How many Clothis have been cast against you in the last two months? No one's playing this card. Three. Three Clothis in the last... And two of them were on the last stream. <laughs> I mean, Clothis is just not good enough anymore, right? I know, but comparing to... I know it's not great, but comparing it to Targnar... 
That's comparing Ragavan to Surgo. <laughs> They're all here. <laughs> They're all here. We have all the bad ones. We have all the dashes. Open tryouts in the John DeBard class deck. <laughs> <laughs> we got some walk-ons on the, the university intramural team. All right, so I'm going to start with that and just see what happens. Um, another bad deck that I want to try to revive is going back to one of my first brews from MH2. I really liked the card Titania Protector of Argoth. That was a reprint from some commander set. So I, I knew I wanted to like try to feature Titania. I especially liked how Titania combos with Kiora Behemoth Beckoner so that every elemental draws you a card. And Kiora ramps you nicely, so you go, kind of go 1-3-5 with you know, Arbor Elf, Utopia, Sprawl, etc. And when I first put this together, you know, we hadn't yet accepted that every deck should be playing Ragavans and every deck should be playing, you know, full <laughs> sets of Solitudes, etc., etc. I want to try to just revisit that concept, right? It's a very simple Gruel curve. Arbor Elf, Utopia, Sprawl, which I'm sad to say you don't see those very much anymore, but... I think it's the fact that Utopia, Sprawl... Like, I was a huge enjoyer of Utopia, Sprawl, Utopia Sprawl went from being an almost uninteractable piece of value and just became something that every white deck can interact in multiple ways on turn one. And that's what devastated it mostly. Right, so it's no longer as reliable to build a 1-3-5 curve because your one drop can very easily be answered, especially as people are loading up on interaction on turn one. They don't want to get hit with Ragavans or anything else. So yeah, it's good now to have two drops. And my original builds of this use Obosh, right? Because, you know, why not? Yeah, why not? I think now it's okay to leave Obosh on the sideline, play more two drops. So I've got some Ren and Six now on the deck. I've got three Soul of Windgrace, three Titanias, four Furies, one Glorybringer, just for old time's sake. I don't think the card is good anymore, <laughs> but if I can get somebody's Omnath with it, I, I love that interaction, right? Kiora into Glorybringer, draw a card, exert, kill the Omnath, and then untap the Glorybringer next turn to kill the next Omnath. <laughs> uh, Glorybringer. What a beautiful relic from the past. Exactly. And three Fable of the Mirror Breaker, uh, replacing what used to be Season Pyromancer. Okay. Four Bone Crusher Giants, and a couple Lightning Bolts. I like this one. It's a simple build. It's like pretty low power. I think that one way to kind of spice it up would be to say, okay, if I'm playing Titania, you should be playing Urza Saga, right? Because Titania has a lot in common with Soul of Windgrace. They can bring back a land. But Titania has a really cute interaction with um, the zero mana artifact that sacks all your lands, right? Yeah, sort of not. Zero and Orb. So if you just have a small Saga package with like a Shadow Spear and a Zero and Orb, you could set up a turn where potentially you chap your three triggers on the saga, you get the Zuran Orb, Titania comes down, sack all your lands, and now you've got all these elementals. Tell me if I'm wrong, because I'm trying to just make memory. If I'm not completely mistaken, Shun Saga evolved from Gruul Delirium? So, like, the original version of Shun Sagarex were playing these, but some guy was like... So, we had the, the Cruel decks that evolved into the Cruel Sagarex for the Delirium package, and that evolved into take out the bad cards like Travers and just play Shun Saga. Like, I think that was the natural progression. Yeah, I think so. I, I put a sample Gruel Delirium list uh, here in the notes. Um, Gruel Aggro, they call it now. Yeah. But yeah, it had, instead of cards like Thought Season and Fatal Push, it had Dragon's Rage Channeler, it had Unholy Heat, Traverse the Ulvenwald. So maybe that's, like, this Shun Titania's Fury, maybe you should try to get Ursa Staga's deck as well. I could see that, yeah. But I, I don't know if you're going to afford Utopia's Pearl, but likely you should. No, you may be right. And I think that once you're playing Ursa Sagas, you are less interested in playing all these I, three and five drops like Bone Crusher Giant. No, no, no. I'm interested. I'm super interested in Titania plus Ursa Saga because of the Suranor interaction, which means you play your saga on turn three, on turn two, three, and if you get a Suranor, and if you have Titania in your hand, you just get a Suranor, and you go turn five, Titania, go, and step sacrifice five lands, get him for 30. That sounds beautiful. I bring like a sort of bigger shun 
Fabulous de Mirror Breaker also being a lot better than Season Pirate, which you know requiring double red in your Ursa Saga package while make while also being able to make pressures to grow the constructs. Maybe you need to take out some of the fluff in the form of Kiora, maybe some of the crushers, but Red and Six, Soul, Titania, Fury, Fable just work together with Saga perfectly in harmony. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll tweak it along those lines and see if it just feels vastly underpowered. <laughs> Hopefully it can keep up. Of course. And finally, a beautiful Maverick deck. A Maverick deck actually got a 5 the other day. Straight up Maverick. So Maverick refers to, like, green-white, neither reliquary, lands, tutor, and it's more of a legacy deck. If you're playing it in modern, you probably have some Titania, so you, you have that Urza Saga patch we talked about. Beyond that, there isn't really a, a Maverick deck. So to call something Naya Maverick, I, I think I just found this list from someone when I was browsing for concepts. And yeah, I, I was interested in what would it look like to combine Solo and Grace, Titania, Zuran Orb, Saga, and miscellaneous land stuff, right? So this player, Chaos Valor 89, um, also chose to use Knight of the, the Reliquary. Excuse me. They did not do that. <laughs> also chose to use Elvish Reclaimer and Renegade Rallyer. The, the 5-0 that, actu- that somehow 5-0 actually had 4 Reclaimer and 4 Knight of the Reliquary. Oh, really? In this day and age. Okay. I mean, yeah. So were they playing Soul of Windgrace? No, because I think they were straight up Celestia, sadly. Like, they didn't have a, even a tiny splash for anything. Hmm. Huh. But, yeah, I love to see this. Uh, like, my favorite card in all of Magic is actually Night of the Relic Quarry. And sadly, I can't run it. You're an old soul at heart. That's a super boomer card. That's your boomer podcast host's favorite card. <laughs> I mean, how can you not love a win con stash to a toolbox package? <laughs> win con, yes, <laughs> exactly. That's how we call it in the past. If Soul of Windgrace is just the new Knight of the Reliquary, I'm going to be very sad. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Chunky Knight. All right, so those are a few concepts from Modern, where you have fetch lands, you have all the tools needed for Soul to succeed. We're going to take a look at Pioneer now, where we don't have the same tools, but it's a lower-powered format, and based on my experiences in Pioneer as I was testing Ether Channeler, I, I do think that Soul could actually be pretty good in the format if you build your deck around it. What are the tools? Well, you're probably going to start with Fable Passage. Yes. I don't know if you're going to go as far as playing the New Capenna. I don't know what you call them. Yeah, the Sacklands. I, don't, I, I always say Sacklands, but that's not what they're called. We saw a few decks using those with like Omnath and Tireless Trackers. You could do that, but you know, Omnath is probably using those in a, in a more powerful way than Solo Windgrace is, so I don't know how many colors you can play. I've seen people playing Sylvan Advocate lately, which is, you know, it's like a two drop that becomes a four or five Vigilance. That's actually pretty solid, and it beefs up your man land. So there are some stuff in Pioneer that you can do, but you have to look a little bit deeper to find the synergies. Luckily, we happen to have uh, an insane Pioneer Brewer. David has left us two Soul of Wind Grace lists, and they both seek to unlock the power of like the land's package in different ways. Yeah, the first one, Chan, Titan, Ramp, where he says he tries to take your concept of it being a Titan and transforms it into a mini Titan to a to literal Titan of industry. Beautiful decklist. So we're featuring just the good old Shan, Value Baggage, Inflat Tight Harvester, Bone Crusher Giant, Final Push, Thoughtseize, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, because why not? But then we're playing a, vi- a few more unconventional cards. Silvan Cariatir, Old Radstain, Three Soul of Windgrace and the whole place of Titan of Industry, alongside three, the Cruelty of Geeks. So let's talk about the Cruelty of Geeks, because I think this is a card that is sneakily good. It just needs a shell that like allows it to do something super powerful. So Cruelty of Geeks is five mana. It's a read ahead saga. Chapter one, which you can skip if you want to. Target opponent reveals their hand, and you get to duress something from it. No, they best. Feature or placeholder. Creature or Planeswalker. Oh, not a duress. My mistake. Chapter 2 is a Grim Tutor. Search your deck for anything, put it in your hand, you lose 3 life. And Chapter 3 is a Zombify, but from any graveyard. Put a creature from any graveyard into play under your control. Yes, 
So I think this thing might like some sort of instant speedway to this card of Titan of Industry. Like turn two, go get something like one Mercant of the Veil, you know? So the pattern that Mord is talking about is, let's say you start the Cruelty of Gix on Chapter 2. You tutor up your Titan of Industry. It would be so great to be able to, on your next upkeep, discard the Titan of Industry so that you're, you're able to reanimate it on Chapter 3. And I think David is accounted for that. He's got the Blood Tithe Harvester, so you, you can discard it to a Blood Token if you have an extra one sitting around. Oh, yeah, you have a Blood Tokens, right. Yeah, you have the four Blood Tokens that you can save for that. I, I, I don't know, maybe when you're playing four Titans of Industry, one is bound to get stuck in your hand and having access to, like, one Mercant of the Bay to tutor with the, with the Grim Tutor and, like, upkeep, sack, um, discard, draw a card. I almost think you want Liliana of the Veil, right? I mean, you have the four Fables. I mean, I know that old Rutstein is here for, like, self mill synergies, but... Lily is Lily. Lily is Lily, and she's a discard outlet. I mean, we see this with the Grease Fang decks. Like, it actually does make a difference to just have extra outlets. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to admit to something pretty dumb, which is, a few days ago, looking at the sideboard, we have pretty common stuff. We also have one Chevil, which shocks me to no end. But I always loved that card, and I always wanted it to see play, so please. I think Chevel Beta Monsters is okay. Like, it's decent against aggro. The card I wanted to discuss was Kerbeck, because a few weeks ago, I saw someone said Kerbeck is the best spice against Ruth Fang. And I didn't understand it until 45 seconds ago. Kerbeck the Spiteful, two black black legendary creature, 3-2... Other creatures, all of the creatures in play, get minus one, minus one. I wasn't able to make the connection why this was good against Chris Fang. I'm not sure it is good against Chris Fang. No, no, th th no, no, this is amazing against Chris Fang, now that I realize. So it prevents them from crewing the Parhelion, but is that all? Like It prevents them, it makes all the 1-1s one -one die on ETV, it makes the Rafins in format die on ETV, all the creatures instead that are not the cats die. Mm. And the cats cannot crew the Zika's Chariot. Chris Van cannot crew the Zika's Chariot either. Nothing can crew anything. But it doesn't actually kill anything, and it leaves those cards in place, so when they kill your Kerbeck, you're screwed. Yes, but that deck does not play many creature removal. It plays a lot of ways to interact with... They play 40k for Witherbloom commands. But they're not consistent at killing a 4-drop. Hmm. I don't know. Actually, it seems super good against them. I hadn't realized until now that just it killed literally every creature in that deck that isn't Chris Fang. I didn't make Chris Fang choose multi group or Helion. So, apart from the Kerevac, just thinking about the construction of the main deck, it has a lot in common with red-black midrange. Yes. It's like a bigger brother of red-black midrange. Yeah, what we've found in the past is that adding a third color, like, we've tried Splashing Green, I tried playing Zia Torres Envoy, that card was terrible. It's hard to find anything you actually want from the third color, right? So David, he trusts Sylvan Curiated. Even in a Liliana meta, he'll still play a couple Sylvan Curiateds. Here, at least, because of Solo Wind Grace, you know, we have a plausible four that we're excited to ramp to. And then Titan of Industry, right? That's, that's the big proposal, is that Titan of Industry can actually break through a mid-range meta. Oh, yeah. Either hard casting it or reanimating it, or both. Hard cast it once, it dies, then you bring it back with Cruelty of Gix. So I believe this deck can go over the top of Jund. Uh, or Rakdos, I should say. I, oh, over the top of Rakdos, for sure. Over the top of Jund, it's always reliant on how well can you deal with... What's the name of the dragon? We talked about it. Horrible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I meant, uh, I meant Rakdos, not, not Jund. Yeah, 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 I yeah. meant like the classic. Classic Rakdos midrange. The Jund of Pioneer, a.k.a. Rakdos Fable with Liana and Sheoldreds, apparently. Everything plays Sheoldred. So in terms of enabling Solo Wind Grace, what do we have? We have the four Fable Passage, we have the Blood Tokens, we have two Old Rudsteins, and the Fable of the Mirror Breaker. So not a ton of enabling. But again, we can, we can grab cards from the opponent. Right? Maybe they are looting some away. This is close to the minimum of what a Solo Wind Grace needs to support it. Just enough lands to actually make sure you're going to get something back every turn. Actually, Lily, you, the more we see this deck, the more I think Lily should be here, right? I don't see why not. 
Even discarding lands is great when you have Soul of Wind Grace in your deck. However, Soul of Wind Grace doesn't incentivize a big resource game, like a game with a lot of resources. Yeah, like, Soul of Wind Grace incentivizes you to play a many resources game, not only with its ability, but also on its discard capabilities. Because even if you flood, you're going to turn those into resources if you have enough lands into play, which Lily doesn't actually interact with favorably. Yeah, I think that's a good way of thinking about it. Okay, so maybe we don't need Lily per se, but yeah, more ways to just see more cards, play a high resource game. We're going to have access to the graveyard, so let's get as much stuff in there as we can. Yeah. So the second concept that David is working on is based on the Shigeki Fires of Invention combo. Now, we've said that there is no lands deck in Pioneer, but there is Fires of Invention, which, if you squint, is a lands matter card, right? It does require you to have lands in play. Yeah. That seems like one of the bullshit, bullshit things like I've heard in a while. You know what, guys? We don't have a lands deck, but Fires of Invention, the <laughs> that, that <laughs> is a lands card. So the hope with Fires of Invention is that once you've resolved it, you, your mana is now free, right? You can cast two spells for free, but you also have your lands available to do other stuff. And what David has explored in the past is using Shigeki Jukai Visionary as a massive card draw engine. Shigeki's channel ability is XX Green Green Discard Shigeki to return X target non-legendary cards from your graveyard to your hand. Cowards. Non-legendary. We sort of... Cowards. Let me return Shigeki with Shigeki. So you can't loop Shigeki with itself, and unfortunately you cannot use Shigeki to get back a soul of Wind Grace. That's a little bit sad. However, you can also cast Shigeki for two, so it has a ramp function, right? It, it's a 1-3 for two. You can pay two, tap, bounce it to your hand, reveal your top four cards, a land among them goes into play, the rest go into your graveyard. I mean, that, that's also helpful. So Shigeki and Fires is like... A powerful way to have an engine. To support that, we need disruption. So we have Fatal Push Thoughts to use Abrupt Decay. David's playing a couple Extinction Events, a couple Hagra Maulings. He's got a River Tears Charm here. Random stuff, basically. We're just looking to interact and not fall too far behind until we get to the Shigeki point. The Shigeki Fires endgame, right? And when you actually want to win the game, Invoke Despair is here as a four of to accomplish that. So Soul of Wingray supports this strategy in a couple of ways. One, it's just generic mana ramp, right? Every time you cast it and get an attack off, you're adding more mana into play, and that means bigger channels with Shigeki. But more importantly, Fires frees up all of your mana to spend it on Soul of Wingray's activated abilities, to spend it on Cracking Clues for Tireless Tracker. There's a couple of those here as well, right? We see the combo between Soul of Wingray's and Tracker to generate the clues, and then Fires gives you enough mana to use them all. It seems like it could work. It seems like a coherent shell. Also, the combo here cl quite clearly is turn 4, fire, turn 5, double invoke despair, turn 6, shigeki, double invoke despair. <laughs> Just shoot your opponent. Exactly like we drew it up in practice. <laughs> Just like the simulation, boys. So one card that I, I haven't asked David about this before, but I'm kind of curious now, is the card Emergent Sequence. It's one in a green sorcery, search your library for a basic land, put it into play tapped, and then you add some counters to it. It becomes a creature land. You end up with either a 1-1 one, one or a 2-2 two, two creature land. Yeah. Nothing too special. You know, it's dice removal, etc. However, it being a creature land actually works nicely with fires, and it also works nicely with Swallow Wind Race. So I'm assuming my opponent will kill it, right? I'll play Emergent Sequence on turn two. Yeah. I get a mountain or whatever. Opponent kills it, but now I've got a land in the graveyard. I got a mountain in the graveyard for my soul of Wingrace to get back. And if they don't kill it, I can actually curve with emergent sequence into fires and immediately play a four drop because I have that extra land in play. So I'm kind of curious. Like I, I see that David did not play Sylvan Curated in this list because it doesn't work that great with fires. Yeah, it makes no sense. But I'm wondering if emergent sequence is like worth consideration. Mm. That actually would make some sense. At least it's interesting. The weird ramp. Yeah, so we'll have to see. I know David is on vacation for a while, so I might uh, take these out for a spin myself, and we'll report back on what we find. 
I'll post a few other lists um, just on the show notes, basic Jundi concepts. You know, there are no published five O's with solo wing grace in Pioneer. I haven't really seen that many people talking about it because we don't really think of Pioneer as a lands format, but the, the tools exist. And, you know, whether it's Tireless Tracker, whether it's Sylvan Advocate, whether it's, I see Gitrog Monster in a list that Will Urker had proposed, there's stuff, right? And if we're on the right track, thinking that solo wing grace is like, comparable to Omnath, then it stands to reason that, okay, in Pioneer, maybe you can also make something happen here. I'm straight, the more I start the deck list, the more I get to question David's choices. But that's just me loving to argue with David. I mean, I think that sometimes he just puts in like one or two of just to remind us that they exist. Doesn't mean that they're yeah. optimized. Yeah, yeah, because he just loves, he, I think David, it, it's like, we are with the toys when we are little. He doesn't want the cards to feel forsaken. Exactly. Yeah. Like, he doesn't want River Tears Charms to feel sad. He can get included with his friends. <laughs> also, how could you do that? You poor Tangle for a hero. He's like, no, don't worry, Tangle. You can play with us. <laughs> and he just adds it to the deck and, like, reminds him and just gives it that sweet smile. Like, don't worry. We are still good. Toy Story 6. You're going through your box of old magic cards. Exactly. <laughs> Adding the Tangle Florahedron back. <laughs> back into the deck. Tangle Florahedron is booty. <laughs> Tangle Florahedron is so of wing race and was like there is some now. <laughs> <laughs> That's my head canon now. All right, Mord. So enough about solo wing race. Um, we want to do a quick check-in on some of the things that we were going off about last week, right? We were talking a big game about Ether Channeler. Yes. Did the card hold up? Well, for me at least, it sort of did as promised, which wasn't a lot. I got like a beautiful 3-2 in the Kokorek by Spike. So I was playing Band Soul Herder with three other Channelers in the main deck. And it wasn't great. Like, the card was one of the best cards in the deck, but it just had the same issues it has always had, right? When you're playing a bunch of walls and Ice Fan Coatles, as long as your opponent kills the correct stuff, you're not going to win. So this is the list that... I mean, you're pretty close to the list that other people are messing with, right? It's Collected Company, yeah. Noble Hierarch, Ice Fan Coatle, Wall of Omens, Wall of Blossoms, boy, a lot of walls. Walls. Three Ether Channelers, four Soul Herders, four Ephemerates, three Eternal Witness, three Solitudes. So you can Ephemerate, get some loops going with your Eternal Witness. You actually have the Time Warp Infinite Loop here as your finisher. Yeah, you tend to really rely on that to be any sort of unfair strategies or decks that go big. So Ether Channeler, it seems like it's occupying like the main utility slots where we used to find other cards. Did it do the job adequately? So it was pretty decent at being the only way to interact with annoying parents like Kalis and the Fairies, but besides that, most of the time it just drew a card. Which isn't great. It did work amazing in one of the games in Arnold League against Burktide. Oh, it also won against Tameshi because I was able to hit it off the collected company, which was pretty good. But any removal would have done that, like any deputy or Skyclave. I think it's good. I just don't think the rest of the deck is great. Like, I really struggle to find it a whole. So is it fair to say the games where you use Ether Channeler to actually disrupt the opponent, like bouncing something important, are the games where it's at its best? I think so, yeah. Because if not, what you're doing... Like, I think it's where you have the versatility of both drawing a card and bouncing something. Like, both modes are good. Like, that's sort of what you need, I think. I had some similar feelings. So I tried two different lists. One is the Bant Teleportation Circle concept that David had proposed. I think he had forewarned with an earlier version, so I wanted to try it out myself. The idea here is that Teleportation Circle, Blinking a Sika's Chariot, or Prophetic Prism, this is Pioneer, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> can see you through the mid-range matchups. And then it's just a question of like, okay, those are both artifacts. I got Ingenious Smiths to find them. Now I got to round out the package. So I'll play Portable Holes. I'll play some Verdurous Gear Hulks. There's a Sky Sovereign, uh, Ethosphere Harvester, etc. You need to support that with some speed. So there's Sylvan Caryatids and Prosperous Innkeepers here. Three Ether Channelers were actually splashing blue just for that card. 
um, because we're, we're hoping that it gives us A, that interaction, but also another target for the teleportation circle uh, to help us pull ahead. And what I found when I played this list was like, yeah, I mean, there were, there were matchups where I used all the modes of the channeler. I mean, like in a grinding yeah. matchup against Rock, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have all these options, right? Like I was at one life, sure. I was making a bird every turn with a teleportation circle to fend off some flying creature. It was cool. It was also like underpowered. Like I, it's kind of embarrassing to have to do that for like four turns in a row. <laughs> That's the thing. Like I think the modes are not powerful enough, right? A lot of the time, even if versatile. Yeah, like the games where, okay, it's turn three, there's nothing in play, so I'm slamming the channeler. I can either get a bird or a card. Like, it's nice to have the option. Neither one is very powerful. Exactly. So you do it, and it's almost like, I felt like the first ether channeler is like a down payment towards the second hmm. ether channeler when you blink it. Like, there you start to pull ahead, but the first time you cast it, you're, yeah. you're still kind of falling behind, even despite the option to bounce things. Yeah, I, I think I agree. That's the main issue. If, if the bounce effect is the most powerful stuff and it's a bad barring, then it's not great. Right, and I think you and David did a nice job of running through how no matter what you're choosing, right, there's a better card for each of these jobs. Right, Baron is better at bouncing. Uh, Deputy Detention, Skyclad Apparition, these are better at removal. There's, you know, there's bigger card draw effects. There's plenty of stuff you can do it's just, if I want to do it multiple times, Ether Channeler is yeah. your one-stop shop. That's exactly, that's exactly how it works. That, that's also why decks like Enigmatic stopped running it, because they were, never, they were never looking for it. This is a Coco card, not a Court of Calling card. I did see it as a one-of in like several published five O's in Enigmatic, but you're saying that you, you feel like that's yeah, but they have started they have started to like removing it. Like no, it's not playing it anymore, and people are slowly catching up to that. Okay, that's good to know. So as for my league itself, um, David went four one. I did not do as well. I went two and three. I lost to decks that just felt more powerful. That m included goblins, which was just better at attacking me. I, I couldn't keep up with the aggression. That's sad. Is it Pyromancer? They just went over the top in the long game. Like We each did our thing, and their thing was just much more powerful than mine. And Jeskai Ascendancy with uh, Land of War Loam Speaker, you know, I had cards that could kill the Ascendancy. I killed a bunch of copies of Ascendancy, but they always had a full grip thanks to Treasure Cruise and you know my sorcery speed options like Portable Hole, etc., they were no match for <laughs> just like untap, play a sentence, kill you. So like those matchups were a little discouraging. I felt like, okay, I'm whatever I'm doing is like a little too fair. And yeah, I was able to like slightly outgrind other fair decks, like black green rock, like mono black, but you know, it felt like we were doing we were doing pioneer wrong and everyone else was having a great time in the winner's bracket, like doing powerful stuff. <laughs> I mean, the fact you said we're losing to power, more powerful decks and then talk about goblins was just... Uh. I know, right? But the Horde Master is, like, such a huge upgrade. <laughs> That's tough. You don't expect to get overrun by goblins, but Foundry Street Denizen, <laughs> Horde Master, they were playing Fanatical Firebrands, Legion Loyalists, Battlecry Goblins. Like, it was, it was quick, and my deck was very clunky by comparison. Yeah, it can happen. Sometimes the Lord just outpaces anything you're trying to do if you're clanking too much. So the last deck I tried, which is one that um, you guys didn't talk about last week, but I know it's one that David's had on his radar. There is a blue version of Devotion in Pioneer where you try to start your game with Leyline of Anticipation. As to Blue Devotion, also lets you play at flash speed. That's very cute. And it's especially cute with the card Academy Lore Master. Mm. Blue, blue for a 2-3 wizard. It's kind of like a Howling Mine, but if you accept the extra card on your turn, all your stuff gets double taxed for that turn. So that's quite punishing. Hmm. And what you want to do actually is have a lot of flash cards so that if you choose to accept the extra card from the Academy Lore Master, you just draw the card past the turn. On their turn, you're not taxed and you just flash in whatever. So the dream is that I start with a Ley Line, I flash in my Lore Master on, their, on end step on turn two 
draw an extra card and I'm just like off to the races. I'm building devotion. I'm doing all this. I'm, you know, powering out Gadwicks and master of waves, et cetera, et cetera. Fast as oracles. Like it's all, it's all very nice when you like imagine this working. I saw a five O list that was pretty recent that gave me some hope. I super wanted to play this when I saw the five O. I really wanted to try this deck because it seems like the fan lines are insane with like when you, when you start with Ley Line of Anticipation, it just seems like the best deck in Magic, right? That was the hope anyway. Also, it plays Toulouse. How can you not love Toulouse? So the 5-0 list was playing three copies of Toulouse Clever Conductor. It was not playing any copies of Ether Channeler, and this was like a little bit of a warning flag for me. Like, is Ether Channeler just bad? Or is it because it doesn't synergize, right? Like, why would you yeah. play Mono Blue and not play Ether Channeler? So I said, okay, I'm going to just find room for Ether Channelers. I'm going to find room for a couple copies of Nabon. Nabon doubles up the Channelers, doubles up Master of Waves, and even doubles up Gadwick if you are, like, living the dream. But I had to cut some all-purpose stuff. <laughs> I had to trim, like, trim one of the Malevolent Hermits, trim a couple of Moonsnare prototypes, trim a Brazen Borrower, et cetera, and trim some Toulouse. Trim... Defiler of Dreams, which the, the deck was playing two of, I decided to go down to one copy. It's a very interesting card, right? It's, this is the Phyrexian Sphinx that allows you to draw a card every time you play a blue spell. Uh, it's a bit optimistic, right? Like, Yeah, yeah. It's like, the, it's like the dream. It's like maybe too much. Did you just went one, two... Was this like a drop or like... Oh, I'm just not finished with the league yet. Oh, okay, okay. I imagine for you to drop a league, it must have like in like a super bad deck. No, I know the game just took a long time. I, I okay, 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 makes sense. Yet. I'm three matches in, but the third. No, no, no. Okay, okay. The third match was against like a Defiler of Dreams mirror match, but their deck was much cooler than mine. This was against uh, Tiamu, who was also playing Blue Nykthos Devotion with Leyland of Anticipation with Defiler of Dreams. But instead of using all these crappy wizards like I was doing, um, TMU was using Witching Wells, Wizard Class, and Omen of the Sea. So like really, really cheap one and two mana permanents. And then they were using Flood of Tears, which is a six mana sorcery that bounces all permanents. And then if you returned four or more permanents, you get to free cast something. So they could either free yeah. cast a Defiler and then play it all again, drawing cards in the process. Or they could free cast omniscience, which they did once, which was kind of uh, alarming when that happened. And yeah, I mean, I think that matchup made very clear that the deck is powerful when its mana is up and running. You know, this version that I was playing with like clunky Thessa's Oracles and Hermits and stuff, like it's it's great when you start on exactly Leyline plus Nykthos plus like Thessa's Oracle. But when you don't have that, like you're you're not keeping pace. And that was especially true, like I drew Ether Channelers all the time. I got to do a lot of stuff with them, but I was usually behind and they weren't closing the gap. So They just weren't enough to catch up on tempo, right? And if the, deck, if the rest of the deck is also clanking, it's tough. Yeah, exactly. Adding a clanky card to a clanking deck sometimes just doesn't pan, doesn't pan out. So I guess that's the question, right? Like maybe it's not Ether Channeler's fault. Maybe we're just asking too much from the card. And I looked around to see what other people were doing with the Channeler. And, you know, there had been a number of 5-0s with Ether Channeler in them. I think the same day we published our episode, uh, a player named Starwalker posted a 5-0 list with, like, a Bant Company deck that was, like, a Humans Company and Pioneer. They said they really enjoyed Ether Channeler there. It's a little bit faster getting on the board, right? Yeah. And, and it, it doesn't suffer from that effect, right, that we were just discussing of getting completely run out. Right, so like this deck is much more aggressive. It's just like humans on one and two, with Thalia's lieutenants, etc. Reflect a mage and Ether Channeler are here because they're humans, and you can company into them for like that final burst of tempo to like break through, for example. Yeah. Uh, I saw another Bant Company deck that was not humans, but that also 5 0 with Ether Channeler, and they were just using, you know, whatever they thought were the most powerful three drops at the time. Archon of Ameria, four of that. They're actually playing three Eldrazi Displacer in that deck, supported by a Darkar Wastes, which was kind of interesting. Because prior to a, a Darkar Waste, you didn't really have enough pain lands to support this. So yeah, I mean it's possible that Ether Channeler is like among the best three drops available. 
if you're just going to choose a shell that doesn't ask as much of it. If it's like playing, a, if it's part of a role play, you're not trying to like get a deck on its back, right? If it's just like an interactive piece, but that's what we were trying to do with Soul Herder. But still, there, even if the card was good, maybe it was the shell that. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it's sort of trying to find a shell that's proactive enough where it can work efficiently, like a human shell rather than a shell where there's us asking too much of it. Makes sense. All right, well, that's what I have found from Ether Channeler so far. Uh, any final thoughts about these before we head into our testing? For Soul of Windbreast, I'm just going to test. I want to test that really bad idea I had with Slogor. But besides that, I'm not going to keep playing it as a bad Omnath because I love it. <laughs> so it's going to keep playing that roleplay for me. I think I'm going to enjoy it. And besides that, let's see what else we can find that we like. Yeah, I, I want to see this 8-Nath deck that you're talking about before Omnath. <laughs> Good old 8-Nath deck. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that uh, we'll start off with some responsible decks, win some matches, feel like Solo Wing Grace is powerful, and then we'll put it into some decks where it really cannot carry <laughs> the weight of these terrible brews on its shoulder. You will, you will hear about the Bard Classic again. I will test it this week for sure. Exactly. And if Bard Class finally works... We're all going to enjoy it because who doesn't love Bard class? All right. So I think we'll leave it here for today. Emmy, always a pleasure. Thanks, Dan. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much for, ha for having me. We'll see you again for Monday episode. For Friday episode. I get my dates mumbled up. <laughs> Have a nice night, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Deck lists for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next time for new brews with Maria, Scholar of Antiquity. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.